Ryan here, and I'm here with, I guess, part two of the Nithing of Matt Pat's video, uh, the one from uh, Gamer Theorist or Game Theory, the video of the Samurai Viking and Knight and Who Would Win. Uh, I've already done one video for this, and I'm doing this one because I had lots of people sending me messages, talking to me, asking me certain questions about it. Uh, and I wanted to like try to explain that I had been up for two days when I did that video and uh, I ran it on for way too long and what I put out was 25 minutes of it. I actually covered everything, pretty much everything, except for a couple of things. They want to know why I didn't cover the frozen frigid wasteland that the Vikings came from, why they ran around naked and the food died instantly and they had to steal to live. The reason why is once I say that, it sounds like a joke. And honestly, I'm not dissing Matt Pat. Everybody thinks I'm making fun of him. They even got mad at me for saying something about the sea axe. I'm sorry, but that's exactly the way he said it. Sea axe. Like it's some kind of boarding axe or a, a, a scuttle axe or something like some special kind of axe for sea instead of the actual blade that it is. And we don't know exactly how it was pronounced uh, back in the day. I mean, to be exact. Uh, like I said, I think it would be more like a Syax, uh, uh you know, uh, type sound if you were doing that type of pronunciation. A lot of people nowadays just call it sax. But the way he did it, I think he was being comical himself. I even think maybe he was clowning on himself in the video to get more attention. Because think about it, if he did a video and did it with basic Wikipedia facts and tried to do it really well done and didn't say ridiculous stuff like that, would he be getting the attention right now? Would have people urged me to make a video? No. So this man may be wiser than we think. I mean, he's doing it because not just, he doesn't necessarily need the attention so much. He's such a successful channel, but he's trying to get extra attention, and he's also getting the facts out. We're all jumping up to our guns and doing it, and I, I think that's pretty much what he expected. But anyway, let's continue. And as for the frozen, frigid wasteland, I just wanted to say that they had a uh, warming that took place in Scandinavia and a population boom. And everybody else, I think, has probably told you this on other channels. That's why I didn't cover it. But what was going on is they were trying to get money to buy land because all the land was taken up and had large populations on it of families and so on, uh, kinships. Well, the only options were to be a merchant and try to make money, uh, be a settler, which almost all the land was taken that they could get to. If they went there and tried to take it, some English lord or king would immediately attack them if they tried to just set up shop there and put up their little homesteads. So what was the options? I mean, they were settlers and they did go find places and they were explorers that discovered new areas. But early on, uh, pretty much being a merchant was the only way to do it legitimately, get money, go back to your homeland, and get enough because no one wanted to give up any land. There was uh, kinships on all the land. So, uh, well, raiding is one option, and yes, it's nothing, uh, nothing uh, against their culture of raiding the proper people if they could find the right people to attack. But one of the things I think that influenced the uh, attacks on the monasteries and churches and so on in the pretty much the church itself was uh, Charlemagne. Early on before Linden's Farm, I uh, believe it was in uh, 782, before Linden's Farm in 793, uh, the Saxon king, one of the Saxon kings, had attacked his men and killed one of his garrisons. Well, he wanted to convert everybody to Christianity. So he beat that king, you know, his men. The, the king himself fled to Denmark, and of course, I'm sure he told all the Scandinavians in, in Denmark that what had taken place, the, Dan the Dansk or the Danish. And then uh, he also had killed 4,500 people, some of them women, children, and old people, to punish them for not converting, but he also forced baptized them before he did it. So that way he would be acquitted of his sins because then they had a chance to go into the great heaven of the Christians. Well, anyway, that took place, and then exactly about 11 years later, in 793, you get Linden's form. Now, people are going to say that's not a coincidence, but it seems kind of fishy to me that he put trade sanctions everywhere also. He said anyone aiding a heathen or a pagan uh, was to be put to death, and no one could trade with them. So it makes total sense to me when you hear about people hiding from the Vikings as soon as they showed up, whether they're merchants or what have you, because they didn't want to be associating with them. Because if they got caught, uh, they could all be put to death. And it would also make sense why they would start raiding monasteries and churches, because if uh, you can't trade with anybody to make this money you want to make and do it legitimately, uh, you only have one option. And who would you attack? You would attack the people who put the trade sanction on you and caused the problems in the first place. 
and that would also include keeps and anything else you could get a hold of that had to do with the hierarchy. So anyway, that's also probably a good reason why uh, uh, you have all the different attacks, like in 845 you have the raid on uh, Paris. I mean, and I actually have a clip of that where I talked about that, and I will be putting that up in a second. But that covers that, and the whole idea of the frigid, frozen wasteland we know is not true. And if that was true, how could you run around naked? Matter of fact, when it was colder, uh, Scandinavians would wear multiple layers of clothing. And wool. When they say wool, they are not wearing uh, sheep hides. They're wearing wool and cloth and linen and sometimes something even softer underneath. So they wore multiple layers to stay warm and oil leather uh, jerkins and stuff over this while they were at sea because a lot of times it was frigid at sea and they went through cold temperatures. Uh, but to bring up something else is the armor. People wanted me to address that one in my viewpoint on it. I thought Scal did a good job on it. But honestly, he said they would not wear any metal armor because at sea it would rust. Well, first of all, they would cover it in oils, anything they had. And they had a sea chest that they would row on. They would actually row, and while they were rowing, they had their chest that they set on that they carried all their belongings on the ship because there was no real uh, hold in it. Some of them had some areas underneath, but most of it was just a, a chest. You put all your stuff in there. Well, if you had your male uh, uh, armor or your bjarni, or bjarnia oiled and you had it in a sack, either an old cloth sack or a wax sack, and in there, it's not going to rust. You're going to have no problems. And plus, Mail itself, if it's worn frequently and often, it kind of polishes itself because it rubs against itself all the time. So it's always knocking anything off and cleansing itself as it kind of like rubs against its own rings. So I really don't think that would be a problem. The helm or either or the helmet, not a problem at all. Most seafarers back then that traveled different places carried their arms and armor with them with no problems whatsoever. So that's why I didn't address this stuff because I think it's kind of redundant. But I did it anyway because a few people asked me my views on it. But anyway, also I wanted to uh, I want to show the extra clips, but I want to bring up the armor drowning thing. Uh, I have a good friend of mine, uh, Varg, and he has the Thulian Perspective. Uh, it's a page where he mostly addresses a lot of stuff from his old band and uh, the game that he made, my favorite. We're going to be doing some more reviews on that, but it's one of the most realistic versions of a game, other than the fantasy to it and the fantasy land that it's set in. He researches real armor and arms and armor and weapons and what have you, everything. Uh, so he watches our channel, he watches Scal's channel, he watches everybody else's channel, but he does his own testing so he can get his own opinion how he's going to set it up. Well, he did one called In Deep Water, and he gave me a shout-out on there, so I'm going to give him a shout-out for uh, over at Thulean Perspective. Go by and check it out. But he tested swimming in male armor with shields, with helmers on helms, and everything else, and he was able to swim in it. So the idea you fall overboard and you drown, <laughs> that's, not that's not true either. So the whole idea of my video to try to make it different than anybody else, because everybody else has covered it, I'm trying to show empirical evidence that what he said is not true, not just citing sources. Pat, Pat says as he brings up the castles and how the Vikings could not storm these castles and they were wearing no armor and they were standing Flexing around outside. Flexing their pectoral um, muscles at it? Oh yes, with their pectoral muscles flexed it would not get these uh, walls to fall well you know we don't know if it was Ragnar or Ragnar but they sacked Paris Paris was like the biggest fortification of its time they sacked Paris do you does anyone understand how, what kind of siege that would be and the ability for them to do that I mean it, it this is just absurd, saying Vikings didn't do anything like that. They were professional armies, professional soldiers. They were led by Jarls and kings when they did these types of things. They could still consider it Viking raids, but actually you would just, if it was any other kingdom, a Frankia attacking uh, the Saxon, Saxony or something, they would just say one king or Charlemagne was attacking the other king, the heathen king or what have you. They wouldn't say there was a raid going on and these are great thieves and murderers and raiders and rapists and all this stuff that came up in history. They just state one king was attacking another king and that's basically all that took place there. I mean, they can say whatever they want, but that's the truth. And they could sack any castle, any fortification if they had enough people. They had some of the best woodworkers around is why they all carried axes and made their own ships and houses, their long houses. So uh, if you look at it this way, they could build anything they needed, towers, ladders, uh, battering rams, uh, anything they possibly needed to siege a castle. A coffin to trick the way in. Oh yes, that was one of the famous stories as well. One of the Vikings actually pretended he was a Christian and needed to be buried. 
Uh, and that shows up in the series Vikings, and no, it was not Ragnar that did that. Most likely it could have been Bjorn, uh, Ironside, uh, and it could have been several other Vikings. The stories showed up that lots of different people have done it through history, but they loved cunning. That's one thing about the Vikings. Uh, he states the knights of the 11th century, and remember these were men-at-arms, or huskarlers, or soldiers of the, the king. Uh, they were not actually knights, or they might have been uh, Normans. Uh, and the Normans liked using the first spears or lances from horseback. Uh, historically, we believe they rode up and threw them. We also know they probably used them as early lances, but not clutch lances, since the reinforced. Uh, uh, and also, they were mounted, and they changed the shape of their shield, were actually strapped on. This could have a lot to do with them using their spears as lances from horseback uh, and attacking that way as a cavalry. Uh, but technically, the knights did not use pole arms in the same manner. They had the same axes. If you look at the Bayou Tapestry that happens around the 11th century, they were using Dane axes. They are using large axes. Some of the heads this size are larger on poles about four foot. This one's a bit short, but that's what they were using. They weren't using pole arms other than spears, if you consider spears pole arms. So this is a misconception, and the other one is the sword. He immediately talks about their long sword. Long swords had not been invented yet in the 11th century as we know them. They didn't even truly have hand and a half swords at that time. They started getting into stuff like that as people started getting more male armor. Around the 12th century, you start seeing hand and a halfers. Uh, so in the uh, early early days, if they talk about a man using a sword two-handed, he was gripping something like this by the palm or something to use it two-handed. I wanted to address the whole thing where uh, somebody was saying that the Norse did not teach the Welsh how to use their bows, or the English even, because they had a very unique style, especially the Welsh. We didn't say, I didn't say that they taught them to do any of this stuff. I said the way that they got them to do it and recognize that having heavy or powerful bows, uh, large draw weights, were useful in combat and worked against armor and were more effective was by using them. We know that the Norse had powerful bows because they speak about it in the sagas. They talk about a man who could shoot through heavy rawhide, which he would cover a shield with, or use his armor sometimes. Heavy rawhide, he could shoot an arrow with no arrowhead on it, just the wooden shaft through that. Well, when you think about it, is that alignment or how skillful he is? No, they're talking about how skillful he is to use that strong a bow and then he could draw a bow that could do such a thing. So, yes, that's amazing. Because normally the shaft would break, but a powerful enough bow could probably put it through, and it's probably a pretty stout arrow. We also get other accounts of strong bows because of Olaf Trygvason. He was uh, Saint Olaf to some people who know him as that, but he helped Christianize Scandinavia. He's the one who burnt down a lot of the uh, uh, Hoffs and so on, destroyed different places that were holy sites to the old heathens. But he also upset a lot of people doing that. He wouldn't marry a heathen princess and even call her a sow or a pig. Uh, he married an Irish woman, which offended a lot of them because they thought he was supposed to marry her. And all in all, uh, with her and other, other people who were against him, they rose up an army to fight him. Well, the famed story of St. Olaf is he's out there on his ship, or Olaf Triggerson. He was also a famous uh, raider and stuff earlier on, or, you know, did a lot of Viking-like things before he tried to Christianize everybody and unify all of Scandinavia. Uh, but anyway, he was on his ship, and it's at the end of the battle. His men have pretty much lost, but there's one guy, Anar, and he's a famous bowman or archer, I mean, to the, to the Norse. He was standing there, and he was shooting arrows through shields, through armor. I mean, he was piercing armor with what he had. I don't know what types of armor. They don't explain this, but we know the people had armor. And... Uh, they had shields, and they were scared to advance because he was putting out arrows and killing people with them, and even one of them supposedly went through the mast of a ship. You know how, how high a pound bow we're talking about here. But anyway, needless to say, uh, during this fight, all of a sudden, there's a big cracking sound. So I'm assuming the bow broke, or possibly the, maybe it's a string. They describe a sound, and it'll, it's, it shocked Olaf. So he asked him, what was that sound? And one of the stories says that he replied to him, that's the sound of the kingdom uh, falling from your grasp. And the reason he said that is his bow had broken. Another part of the story says that uh, he, Olaf says, well, here, use my bow. 
So he hands him the bow, and he grabs it, and he draws the string back with one of his arrows, and the bow bends all the way back, and the arrow uh, pops past the uh, bow. And when he does that, he goes, oh, no, this is not strong enough. Your bow is too weak. This will not work. So then he switches to his axe and shields and fights to his death. Olaf, after that, supposedly by legend, which one you believe, jumped overboard and either tried to swim to shore and drowned, which I highly doubt that because we already know that's not real likely, uh, or he drowned himself intentionally, or maybe he got away because some stories say he lived with his sister. But the Christian story is that he was a saint and he was hauled off to heaven. To state why I have a problem with him saying that they could have all met in the 11th century. First of all, the Viking Age was from the 8th century to the middle of the 11th century. And he's stating that the knight existed in the 11th century. The knight technically did exist in the 11th century because of the uh, Knights Hospitaller that was from the First Crusade, which happened well after 1066, which 1066 was a Battle of Hastings, and that is when the Viking Age technically ended. That's why in the other video I had brought up uh, uh, Harold uh, Heldrada, and the reason I had brought him up is they considered that the end of the Viking Age in uh, England. After the, battle, uh, after the Battle of Stamford Bridge, and the lone uh, Viking with his axe and shield, I'm assuming it's an axe and shield, I hope it's, that's what he was using if he killed 40 people, holding them off. Uh, when he did that, which one of the things to me that shows their uh, ability, if they were still heathen and everything, and like the old Vikings and they were the old style uh, warriors, they would do that. So I mean that shows the psychological advantage to me there. But uh, against fighting, they would be fighting against the uh, Saxon kings, their Huskarlers, and uh, the, the footmen are the uh, men-at-arms that they had. And yes, there were some horse, horsemen and so on. Even the Vikings at that time were carrying horses on their ship and using them for scouts and some warriors to get around more rapidly like the leaders and so on. But no one had seen mounted cavalry until the Normans showed up like that with shock troops and actual lances and then lancing from horseback. No one had seen that yet. And yes, if he would have said that the Normans were technically knights, but they were not called knights, and they could have fought the Vikings, which then you could, if you're saying they're proto-knights, then maybe those are the knights they'd be fighting, then yes, they could technically probably fight them. But I picture them fighting the people in England and know they were not knights at the time, even though they were retainers and so on, or under kings and swore allegiance to them. They were not, not knights because they were not called knights yet. But the actual knights that were were uh, created in the 11th century came about in 1095 when a hospital was attacked during the First Crusade. Uh, then the uh, church, and uh, don't want to get me wrong here, I'm not sure, I believe his name was uh, Pope uh, Fascal or something like that. I could be wrong on his name, so if everybody knows, you can say, but I believe that was the proper name, uh, had organized a group called the Knights Hospitallers. Now these guys were to defend hospitals because the hospital was destroyed. Okay, and the whole point on that, they were the first group to use the term knight, to actually use it as their title. Now, they weren't the knights that everybody keeps talking about, the knight who swore allegiance to the king, he was dubbed on the shoulders with the uh, sword and smacked, and may that be his last blow, and he hung, hung a chain around his neck. Not that kind of knight. This was, this was a different order of knights, and yes, they were very devoted just like the Norman, the, the piety that they had and the allegiance they had with the church and, and Charlemagne. So, yes, I mean, the, the Normans are very knightly, and they are the beginning of the true knights that become mounted warriors later that were chivalrous and uh, uh, chivalry. Uh, the art of horsemanship uh, is, is what they did. Uh, they were chevaliers. So uh, if you look at that, then yes, they were the beginning of it, and they were the proto-knights. So they kind of did exist with the Vikings because they were there in 1066, but they actually fought King Harold, not Hel Harold Heldrada. So if you look at it that way. Anyway, the whole thing is, is the samurai will bring that up. I didn't get to bring this up in it, but at that time they were bushi, not samurai. The term samurai had come about... Uh, in the 10th century, and it was in a poem, and it was also a listing of it. But what it was, it was not the warrior, it was a uh, servant of the land, and we brought that up. It was somebody who was a 
uh, basically uh, worked uh, civilly with the people. He wasn't a warrior per se, the name, but it means someone who serves. Uh, later, after late uh, 12th century, uh, they actually get the term samurai, but this was well after the Mongol invasion, and you have uh, Kublai Khan who came in, he brought some Koreans with him, because he'd already fought in Korea and taken parts of Korea. Now, they brought the long pikes with them. And if you look at this, they use tactics very much like they would use in Europe with uh, long spears and pikes and so on. And uh, the yari was very uncommon. The bushi they had then were used to warring with themselves. They wore the, um, the heavy armor. And yes, it was heavy armor, but it was lamellar. The helms were quite solid from what I've, I found. I did a little more research on it. But the, it was not armor for foot, footmen. The armor was very heavy, it was for horseback, uh, and they normally did not fight on foot at all. All they did is ride around and shoot arrows at each other, and their, their, uh, their actual swords, or tachi, were used to ride by, and pretty much like cavalry saber charges and so on. So they did miserably well, they, they didn't do any good at all. They, did, they were horrible fighting against the pikes and the poles and stuff, and shields and stuff that the actual uh, uh, Mongols had. The only reason they won because of a typhoon, and they call it the Kamikaze, or Divine Wind. And that destroyed most of the ships uh, and caused them to have to uh, call a retreat, the ones that survived. So it was a great victory for them, but this is when they unified as the samurai, late 12th century. So that's well after uh, the 11th century that they become the true samurais. We know them, and they start using Yari, and you start getting Ashigeru, which they learned from the people they fought against which were the light footmen with uh, armor on under the samurai, and they start using the uh, nagiyari, the really long ones, the ones that are 18 to 21 feet long, the really long yari. That's when that comes about after that battle. So now that you see that, they weren't used to fighting anybody but themselves, so I think it would be very much the same thing in a large group. They would have trouble with the Europeans. I, I really do, especially the, the, the all the different diversity you'd have against Vikings or even... Normans or the the uh, uh, Huscarls with the uh, Saxon kings or what have you. Uh, the other thing is I, I came to my conclusion because of armor. The armor that they were wearing, you could have full coverage of the mail, and they did by the Crusades. If you were saying 11th century, they had full coverage and even face plates on their helmets, like the uh, the uh, actual uh, knights I was talking about that were. The Knights Hospitaller that exists at the very end in 1099s when they actually were functional. So basically the beginning of the 12th century. So what we're trying to say is there was no niches in this mail. So grappling, they're not going to be able to stab the guy. The arrows won't go through. We've showed that in the other one. Uh, so what are they going to do on horseback? They're going to ride around and loose all their arrows. And yes, they have pretty decent armor on, but they're not set up to be on foot. And... Uh, you know, I, and with shields, you're gonna have, at that time period, everybody had bayou shields, like large tower-like shields. Or, if you were talking about the Vikings, they had their round shields, but they knew how to use them, and they knew how to block arrows. And a shield is a form of armor. If I use this shield correctly, I'm standing here, that's why I'm standing here to make the point on this one. If I was some poor Viking, or somebody who didn't have his armor on, and I use a shield right, I can still live and not die, because I'm using my shield correctly. As long as I don't get flanked, or surprised in some way, I can stay up and stay alive just with a shield. Uh, samurai didn't have shields. They were wearing their <coughs> uh, O Yorari, which was the great armor from back in the day that they wore on horseback, and they had their O Sode, which was, that was their shield. And the big old boxy, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, coverage on the legs from their, their Do was their leg protection. So if you look at it correctly, that is their shield the shoulders and them trying to shoot from behind it with their archery. So at that point I'm looking at, uh, I don't think it would be any more successful than it was against the Mongols. Now in single combat, uh, their armor wasn't designed for it, although it would be quite protective. Uh, their arms were designed for archery, they were very vulnerable to getting broken and stuff by axes and different types of weapons the Europeans were using. Uh, and I don't think they'd have any trouble or, or anything with it because the actual warriors, the Normans, and the Vikings had been to the Middle East, and we even find a piece of lamellar in Birka. In Birka, there was a 
group there and we actually find a piece of lamellar. And we even have references to scale like armor or lamellar in some of the sagas where they complained and said it fell apart and it was no good and it wasn't good as male. It didn't protect them as well as male. Now, we do know that's not totally true because good lamellar later century uh, could stop uh, bu uh, bullets from certain types of firearms. And, I mean, that's really good armor, but it still has the problem. It can be cut, uh, fall apart. You can stab into it, cut it, pull it open if you're grappling. And I want to bring up the point, the other reason in single combat, and the whole game set up in a single combat basis, if you really think about it, other than the ridiculous stuff where you're running around killing a bunch of people like they're nothing, which would never happen, then you're fighting each other in armor, cutting through armor and so on, but it's single combat. You're in castle-like areas, you're in areas that are, are uh, actually fortifications, fighting up and down stairs, in and out of uh, doorways and stuff. Uh, you're in forest area. Uh, if you were trying to fight the samurai on horseback, the cavalry just doesn't work in those situations. Not even for the Norman would it work, or for the later century knights. Uh, it wouldn't work in, in those situations. Uh, I mean, you could ride up and try to fight him with your sword from the back of, of the mount, uh, but that's not giving you that great an advantage if your mount's not wearing barding and armored as well. Uh, a uh, Dane axe or a great axe that was used at that time period for a polo arm could kill your horse and take it down or a spear easily or some arrows. So if you look at that type of situation, then it has to fall between the Viking and the other warriors. If you want to throw in the uh, Normans, who knows? Maybe the Normans, if you consider them proto-knights, could probably win. But if you go with the later century knights, as good as the armor was, uh, and the way that they fought, and then you go with the earlier Viking style, uh, the Viking has a chance one-on-one, -on -one, like I said, and that's specifically for that reason. Uh, he can still get it on him, and that's how most of these matches end. If you look at Tallhoffers is a perfect example where... Uh, he actually cuts the straps on the guy's arm because almost all these matches end in grappling. That's why you see half sorting. You don't see them swinging swords at each other when it's to the death. You don't see uh, uh, you know, them trying to kill each other that way because it's ridiculous. It's mostly going to be grappling and trying to go for niches and stab the guy somewhere where you can actually injure him, not trying to go through his metal armor. So when we look in that account, then yes, the Viking has a good chance. Uh, I'm sure that the samurai could have a chance, but with his bulky armor, I'm sure he wouldn't have a lot of fun grappling. Uh, and the, the armor of the knight was so, so protective at that time period, and the technology increased uh, in weaponry and the way they fought, that I still give the edge to the knight at the very end, if you say, in their heyday. Everybody was in their heyday. The samurai's in his heyday, the viking is, and, and, and the knight. I'd have to give it to the knight on that one even in you know, large units and groups and stuff, because they'd all have their retainers and their men at arms underneath them. And there were so many different types of units that the knight could be over. Uh, and the samurai pretty much had their units. Uh, and it would, they'd be pretty even on the, on the field on the men, if you're just talking about men. But I'm just saying, if you're giving it, if you're saying single combat in those type of situations, I'd give it to the knight, but he could still be defeated. He's not invulnerable. Uh, and then I would probably say the Viking, because like I said, the shield is armor, and the way he was used to fighting, he would just need to get in to, to pull something off. So, anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the video. I hope I explained why I picked certain things. Uh, and, uh, farewell.